Revelation Explained Plus, a weekly series where we will be diving deeper into the book of Revelation. Pastor Gary will be answering your texts and questions related to our previous Sunday's Bible study. Let's join him now. Please send in your questions to us. You send them to the um, to the the number that we have written when you see it on the stage when we're streaming our uh, services out, and we'd love to answer the questions. Just try to keep them somewhat permanent or pertinent. Excuse me. Uh, to the book of Revelation, to end times, that kind of a thing. And we would love to delve into those and to answer those. So without any further delay, as I pull up my phone here, uh, let me go through this. What does it mean that Jesus will come in the clouds? Um, I often talk about Jesus coming in the clouds. In fact, one pastor was quoted as saying when he was living a sinful life, he used to go outside and check and see that as long as it was a a cloudless day he was okay because there would be no clouds for Jesus to come riding back on now we know that that's not necessarily true what does it mean that Jesus will come in the clouds is he literally coming in the clouds or is it just poetic well let's look at a couple scripture texts first of all what's being quoted here to me is Revelation 1 and 7 look he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him and those who pierced him and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now you've got to kind of understand what's happening here. First of all, in the days that this was written, as they looked up to the sky, that gave them this huge panoramic view. And of course, that sort of encompassed their whole world, right? They were thinking, I mean, today with the, um, the radar and Dopplers and all kinds of things, we see vast areas and satellites afford us that well in the mindset of the people of the day you know seeing the clouds in the sky they just assumed everybody saw those clouds in the sky but this is coming from a couple different references by the way and listen closely because i do believe it is literally talking about every eye will see christ coming now listen to what it says in matthew 26 and 64 jesus tells the religious leaders uh, they will see the sun coming on the clouds of heaven okay Secondly, in Zechariah 12 and 10, it says that Jerusalem's inhabitants will mourn when they see the one they have pierced. So now some people read into this idea of clouds as something um, uh, metaphorically, uh, uh, you know, an analogy of something. But I, I believe what they're talking about is everyone will be able to see him. And, uh, you know, I believe the scripture speaks about that often and the idea uh, of being able to see him. Listen to what it says uh, in the book of Acts uh, as it talks about those looking at Jesus after he gave the Great Commission. Uh, in Acts 1 9, it says, He was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. Well, now they're talking literally a cloud. He, as he ascended back into heaven, he, they watched him until what? Until he was hidden up in the clouds. Now, you know, the angels that were standing there. Um, said, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way. You have seen him go into heaven. So what do we have? We have a cloud that's mentioned at his ascension. And then we're told again in our original text there that we will see him coming back with the clouds. So there's no reason not to believe that Jesus Christ literally will be coming in or on the clouds. And so I hope that that answers your question. And as I often say to our congregation, many times I am checking out the cloud formations and I'm thinking, Jesus, that would be perfect for you to come back. Part of that is, of course, selfishly, I want to see him come back sooner than later. Now, the next question kind of has the same vibe to it, okay? Um, and it says, uh, or I'm being asked, you often say you believe in the imminent return of Christ, which I do say often. I believe in an imminent return of Christ. And this person goes on to say, what do I mean by that? Now, you know, first of all, let's explore the word imminent, right? You know, a sudden, a sudden appearing um, it means it can happen at any moment is what it means. And uh, close at hand is the idea. So let's put the rest, the idea of the word imminent. Close at hand happens anytime, usually suddenly when we're talking about imminence is what we're talking about. So I believe that Jesus Christ, and when I say that, his return could happen suddenly at any time and nothing else biblically needs to happen. What do you mean? Prophetically, 
Nothing else has to happen for Jesus Christ to return in the rapture. In the rapture, nothing else has to happen for Jesus Christ. Now listen, this is important. Distinguish between the rapture and the second coming. Okay, first coming, 1.0, that's Jesus coming into this world, born of a virgin, living his life, in, uh, uh, you know, born in Bethlehem, of course, growing up and uh, doing those things, and then his earthly ministry. That was 1.0, Jesus Christ coming into the world. 2.0 is the second coming of Christ. Much is written about the second coming of Christ. Again, uh, when we see him coming, behold, he comes riding on a cloud, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. When we sing those songs, we're talking about his 2.0, 1.0 birth, 2.0 second coming. But wedged in there is 1.5. What's 1.5, Gary? 1.5 is the rapture of the church. So you must distinguish between 1.5 rapture, 2.0 second coming. If you get those confused, it's going to lead you to some real problems. So I am a pre-tribulation guy. That means I believe the rapture 1.5 happens before the tribulation period, which the tribulation period must happen before his 2.0 second coming. Is that clear? So what are you saying? Well, as a pre-tribber, Jesus Christ, I believe, will take the church because it says we will meet him in the air. Not on the earth. The church will meet him in the air. Well, when will that be? That will be rapture time is when that will be. And that's where we will meet him. See, we're the only ones, being a pre-trip person, we're the only ones who can truly honestly say that we believe in the preeminent return of Christ. You see, if you believe that we don't get raptured until the mid-trip period, three and a half years, remember the tribulation, seven years, if you believe that we're not going to be raptured until three and a half years in, you can't, you can't say you believe in an imminent return because other things must happen. If you believe in pre-wrath, which there's a segment of people who do, if you believe in pre-wrath, you can't say, I believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ because many other things have to happen. If you are what we call a post-trib, then you must believe uh, or you're saying that there's no way you can believe in an imminent return because you've got seven years of tribulation period to go through first. You see, only a pre-tribulation view of, of rapture can allow us or afford us to say, let me share the good news. Let me share the hope that lies within me. Let me share with you that Jesus Christ is going to take the church out of here at any time, at any point. Why? Because we can only speak of his blessed return. Uh, Jesus spoke of his return often is what he did. And so the questions the disciples would ask would be things like, well, when will these things happen? They said in Mark uh, chapter 13, verse 4. Jesus responded to them later on in that same text, 32 and 33. Of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time is near. By the way, be on the alert has everything to do with imminence, you believing that he's coming. Now think with me for a second. If, in fact, the church is here during the tribulation period, we will know when Christ is coming. We can count the days because the scripture tells us how many days are going to happen before the return 2.0 of Christ. So if the church is here, we will know who the Antichrist is, which, by the way, the scripture says we won't know as the church. But it also says that we, won't, we can't know the hour or the day of his return. Well, as the church, we will certainly know the hour and the day of his return. Jesus taught his disciples to watch for his return. You must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Luke 12 and 40. And again, be ready, be alert. It's all about imminence. We are, as pre-trib people, the only ones who can say, that we believe in an imminent return of Christ. And by the way, the New Testament church often talked about the idea of being ready. Philippians 3 and 20, Titus 2 and 13, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6. And so the early church was being taught to be ready for the return. So how much more should we be ready for the return? So in other words, the second coming is not the imminent return of Christ. There's nothing imminent about the second coming. You still have seven years of tribulation. The only imminent, 
the only imminent uh, event is the rapture of the church and only if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. To have your questions featured in Revelation Explained Plus, be sure to send them in to the number found in both the description below and on the screen Sunday morning. Joining us today, we have Frank Epolito of Calvary Chapel Vineland. Let's join them now. So, Pastor Frank, as we're opening up our uh, Bibles here and as people are going to be following us along as they tune into this thing, um, a couple things. Uh, first of all, any thoughts? As Because I notice in Chapter 7, we start with a simple thought that after these things so obviously as we're taught in you know understanding the word of god when we read that we have to go backwards a little bit and discover what we need to do anything about six chapter six of course dealing with the seals and what's being opened there any any thoughts come to mind just that that seem to that seem to be pertinent to what we're going to cover here in seven for you yes absolutely if, in fact i would go back even further to chapter four all right chapter four is the uh you might say the courtroom. Uh, chapter five becomes no. Chapter four is the throne room. Chapter five is the courtroom. Yeah. Okay. I would call chapter six the war room. Ah, uh, in that's that awesome. This is when, of course, the only worthy one, the Lamb, is starting to uh, uh, peel off those seals from the scroll, uh, whatever that scroll literally means in heaven. We'll have to wait and see. There are different sure. opinions, of course, but what we do know is that each each time the Lord peels off one of those seals, something bad happens on the earth. So it's very possible that chapter 6 can be more or less uh, viewed as the Lord directing what's going on on the earth in view of the wrath that has been promised for generations, the wrath right. of God promised upon uh, the deniers and the rejectors of god right so, yeah that's well, a bad it's a bad uh it's a bad chapter beginning it's only the beginning but it is a, a bad chapter with those six seals that are opened there, up. there's no doubt about that i think that what it kind of concludes with the idea of of even the mighty men you know the captains and everyone else crying right. out that as they're hiding out in the caves uh whether that's a metaphorical thought or a literal thought i tend to think take it literally but they're crying out that the rocks would fall on them i mean that's yeah that's pretty bad stuff you know well I, I you know however we want to interpret it like we said of chapter six as far as metaphorical or literal uh the wrath of god is is literal so there's something Amen. coming and however that gets poured out on the earth and upon rejecting mankind it's not going to be pretty so um, we definitely want to make sure we're on the right side of that uh, outpouring. Yeah. <laughs> we want the yeah, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, not Amen. the wrath of God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's a great way to put it. You know, I, I'll, I'll tell our congregation, I remember back in the day, there used to be a commercial. It was, it was for a gas station or something like that. And you had this greasy mechanic, and uh, he's talking yeah, yeah. about your car, and he tells you, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. Right, and I uh, and that. I. <laughs> yeah, and I think often about that when I tell our people when they come out, and I'm like, look, you can, accept. it's like Jesus saying, you can fall on the rock right now, or the rock's going to fall on you right. and crush you. So, but yeah. anyway, so it's as you look at that. that all roads, all roads lead to God. And that's true. <laughs> it's just, yeah. oh my God, there's one road that leads to life, another one leads to destruction, but they all end up at God's throne. Uh, that's exactly destruction. right. That's that's how how true and unfortunately how sad for those who choose to reject right i mean it's yeah. just it's a sad thing you know just as a side note as we're kind of uh delving into this i'm going to ask you a question obviously that it's just your opinion more than anything else as you're looking at the world around us um uh do you see the fulfillment of these things going on do you see that we're that 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 clock has ticked and is there is there a reason to believe in the imminent return of christ at this point well, Jesus said in Luke 21, um, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and Amen. lift up your head. So at the very least, we're close to the beginning. We're seeing some strange things. Yeah. And uh, we, we can't ignore them. Amen. Uh, I, even, the, you know, the whole thing of the COVID uh, crisis sure. and uh, the situation and you know, one of the things that's been striking me... I'm not me familiar is, with that. I'm sorry. What yeah, is that? All right. Let me explain it. No. <laughs> as, oh, I here, as I sit here... As I sit here... You know, right? Let me explain it to you. 
<laughs> no, uh, you know, you, you think about that one verse, and um, um, I forget exactly where it's pinpointed, but uh, about the perplexity. You know, in the last days, men will be perplexed. Yes, yes, that's that's a big sign right now. We can't we can't figure out anything. Not we, seriously, we're having trouble figuring out which toilet to use. That's how perplexed we are. We're yeah. we're under a, a great strain to find. Uh, good leaders or um, common sense uh, leaders in government. It just doesn't exist. So no. um, it's not just government. It's just the way people are thinking. And Oh, yeah, it permeates churches. It permeates. Yeah, sure. yeah you can just tell people are befuddled. They're, they're yeah. perplexed is a better word yes. for it. And we definitely see it. And so yeah. it says that in Chapter 7, after we're kind of going through those seals that you alluded to and watching uh, Jesus opening these seals, and by the way, Thus, once again, reminding us that it is the wrath of the Lamb. I mean, yeah. this is the wrath being poured out. Yeah. Um, it tells us, that it start off in 7 there, that uh, after these things, Metatalta again, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, and they're holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind is not blowing on the earth, the sea, or any tree. Uh, any, any thoughts, first of all, on the angels? Any thoughts on that text there? Anything that you derive from that that you find to be important? Well, I think the answer to that comes with a couple of verses later, um, in verses two and three, actually, where uh, we see the reason why that had to happen. But uh, this, I think, we call this the calm before the storm. Oh. Uh, you know, it's coming; it's coming for sure. But before it has to happen, those one hundred and forty-four thousand have to be protected and sealed because they have a particular mission uh, on the earth and in, in what they're going to do for the Lord. And uh, so, uh, you know, the calm, I mean, if you can imagine no wind on the earth, the four corners of the earth, of course, you know, belong to the east, north, south, east, west. You know, I would call that the the compass, you know, the the four quadrants of the earth. Right, okay. The earth is, is round. It's not, it's not uh, square. So we right. have to look at north, south. And I think it just means the whole earth is going to be in this pause, a calm, to where nothing is going to happen. Not even waves in the sea. You won't hear the waves crashing on the sea and things like this. That, and it's going right? to be, everyone's going to be looking around going, what in the world's going on here? This is a different sort of a thing. And uh, I think that's the calm before the storm. And I think verse um, 2, the angel, the, then I saw another angel descending from the east, having the sea, a seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice, and the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Right. Uh, saying, in verse 3, do not harm the earth, the sea, and, or the trees till or until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Mm -hmm. So this was just a pause. I don't know that we have to make a huge thing about verse one necessarily, other than to come to grips with why it was necessary. Wrath yeah. was about to be poured out. Now, some have called chapter seven a parenthesis. Right. You know, uh, the, the parenthetical chapter sure. in that chapter six explains what's going to happen. And oh, uh, by the way, before this happens, uh, we have to take care of these sealed saints. Now, I, I call chapter 7, uh, I would entitle the chapter Tribulation Saints, uh, which is a sort of a strange thing for those of us who believe in a, a pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah, explain that. That's interesting. Kind of think that there's not any saints in, in the tribulation, but there are going to be saints Amen. in the tribulation. These, in fact, are saints in the tribulation. Uh, they are the 144,000, of course, as chapter, verse 4 tells us. But uh, and then, then and then going into, you know, the the breakdown is, as we see, there's all kinds of uh, symbolism there, if you wish. But, uh, you know, these these things have to happen. But in chapter six has to happen. But before chapter six has to happen, we have to take care of these saints because they have a job to do. They have a and job. It's going to be so horrible on the earth, so terrible on the earth that everyone is going to be affected except these protected saints so do you believe then uh and i had a question asked and i thought it was interesting so those then the, the ministry i'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit 
But those the, the, the ministry of the 144,000, again, as we're, we're often told, are, you know, and I, I've heard it in the Calvary circles, uh, you know, 144,000 Billy Grahams that are going out into the world. <laughs> to preach the gospel. I, I wish I could register that and put it on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker, but I'm not allowed. So yeah. the 144,000 are going to go out and share faith. The people that become believers, will they be sealed also at the moment? Do you believe? I don't think no. it speaks of it. No, no, they will not. And I think oh. that's, that's why I call the chapter tribulation saints. There are two groups of saints, 144,000 sealed Jews and at the bottom of the chapter, you have a multitude that can't be counted who come through the tribulation. They, too, are saints, but they're not protected. They come through via martyrdom. So they're, right. they're, they're killed. They're going to face all of the wrath of, of an angry population uh, because they're angry at the wrath of God. They're angry what God, what's happening around them. And, of course, they may be shaking their fists at God and even blaming people yeah. who still call upon the name of God. So yeah, well, the, there's no doubt. the persecution is going to be horrendous, I think. So forgive me for jumping ahead, but let's go backwards just a moment. We see then that um, because there are people who get confused about who these 144,000 are, um, unfortunately. And uh, I, I think it's important that we sort of designate who they are because the scripture tells us that. So we, we get through three, then we get into four there, and four says, and I heard the number of those who were sealed. Once again, using specific numbers, which I really think is great because it doesn't leave it for, you know, the, the, the to think about it as an allegory or that it's anything other than an actual number is what we can take this as. And when it says 144,000 uh, children of Israel, uh, we know that they'll be male. And I, I remember breeding someplace before that there'll be virgin males is what I remember reading. Chapter 14 tells us that. Yeah. So we know that beautiful. So we've got that. And then it tells us the tribes, anything about these tribes that, that you find to be interesting, or is it pretty much just cookie cutter? Like he's just giving us the designations. Well, first of all, chapter 14, as we mentioned, does tell us they are all virgins, meaning uh, that really, I think if you want to look at it this way, they don't really have time for personal relationships in that way because they know time is, they're, they're not going to get involved in marriage and relationships because this is the end. There, there is no time. They know it's the end. They know that the time is up, first of yes. all. Second of all, Revelation 14 tells us that these all follow the Lamb. So these are not just Jewish people. They're Christian Jews. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, they are uh, considered uh, to be followers, but what do followers do but multiply? You know, they duplicate themselves. So we know that they're going to be uh, witnesses on the earth of Jesus Christ. I suspect, yes, obviously 144,000, there are millions right now of Jewish people in Israel. Uh, and, and around the world. So I suspect that the 144,000's mission might be primarily to Jewish people, though I don't think they'll be, uh, you know, particular. I think they're just going to share the gospel. But I think it's specifically to give the Jews one last chance to get right, to get back to God where you belong, you were chosen by God. I think there's another thing to point out. As you mentioned, some look at it as allegorical or, um, you know, uh, don't take it too literally, right? Right. Uh, right. Because uh, you know, there's this thing uh, floating around uh, the the, the uh, replacement theology, uh, and and so they don't they they don't they don't want you to take the twelve tribes and their breakdown too literally because you'll get caught in the weeds. Uh, just know that God has no plan for Israel. Uh, the church has replaced Israel. That's replaced yeah, exactly. Theology. Replaced theology, sure. Some really big names are are into this. John uh -huh. Piper, for instance, is really big into this. He's, yeah, right. He's huge into it, and uh, meaning that there is no future plan or purpose for the the people of Israel or for the nation of Israel. In fact, Piper, I don't mean to rag on him. You know, I don't mean it. That's not what I'm trying to say, but. Just here's a big name who's very eloquent. He can speak. We love to hear him. We love to read his books and watch his videos, you know, because he's intelligent and can really bring, bring the gospel in, in, across in a clear way. But, you know, he, he said, I don't even want to go visit Israel. I, 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 anywhere I am, Jesus is there. So I don't want to go to Israel 
to meet Jesus. And apparently, you know, he wrote that at a time when uh, he, 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 wrote, he talked about it in an article uh, where he uh, basically said, I, I'm not going to Israel because I don't need to. And not that you wouldn't, not that you, no one has to go to Israel. We, we know that. We just like to. But my, my point is, that's how deeply he believes in this yeah. replacement theology. Yeah, the sad. church is the final, the final uh, people of God, uh, rather than the children of Israel. Amen. But the children of Israel have a different plan, Amen. different than the church completely. We're, well, didn't Paul kind church. of put that to rest? What is it, nine? Is it nine when he says, is, uh, is God finished with Israel? I mean, yeah. he's not. Selena. Yeah. It's, uh, so, listen, I, while I, I can enjoy some of the things Piper has to say, and I find him to be very articulate, very intelligent, yeah. I'll take Paul. Yeah, yeah <laughs> <I'll> me too. <laughs> <I'll be Paul. laughs> yeah. But anyway, so we're looking at these sealed Jewish, male Jewish um, uh, virgins that we're looking at. And I, I agree with you. I concur with you wholeheartedly. I think what it's indicative of is, look, Paul even told us, you know, when you're married, your ministry, that you're, you're ministering there. Like, so he even said what minister as if you were single with the mentality. Well, here you have these male virgins that are able to put a hundred and uh, 28 or 180, 186 hours a week into, um, into serving the Lord. And, uh, cause time is of the essence at this point. Um, so just a, another question, opinion question for you. Uh, we do know when we get to the bottom of seven here, it's going to talk about those who have gathered, um, around the throne that have been martyred uh, subsequently, probably much from the ministry of these, uh, Jewish, um, evangelists, but so you're believing then it's centralized in Israel, but obviously it's still going to go forward, right? It's still going to go out to the Not world? Not necessarily so. No, I, I think that the 144,000 will have their specific task or their specific oh, very uh, good. The, the martyrs at the end of the chapter are people who will come out of the, the uh, tribulation. They will get saved for several reasons and not just the Jewish uh, evangelists or, right. or 144,000. Uh, I think there are other reasons, and if if we get down that far, we we could talk about that. You know, there's all kinds of reasons how and why I think people can get saved during the Great Tribulation. I, I mean, Amen. think about it. You got angels flying in heaven preaching the gospel. You got, right? Uh, you know, people we're preaching to now that are going, ah, that's craziness. It's crazy. And poof, we're raptured out. And once we're raptured out, then you've got a bunch of people going, man, I should have listened. I should have listened. You know. Right. We, we're dropping seeds. We're dropping seeds. And, um, you know, there's certain seeds like an acorn, for instance, they say the best way to burst open an acorn is to a forest fire. You know, if they, they drop on the on the forest floor, but it takes years and years and years for them to. Sure. Decompose. But a forest fire breaks them open immediately. So, you know, that's a, a good way of looking at what we're do doing right now in preaching and giving Amen. people the gospel. Even if they laugh at us or, you know, throw us out or reject us, it doesn't matter. We're dropping seeds, and those seeds are going to have an opportunity, even after we're gone from this earth, even after the church has been removed Amen. from this earth, those seeds are still there. And uh, the tribulation is going to pop them wide open, I think. If you'd like to hear more on this topic, the previous Sunday sermon is always available on our YouTube channel please consider subscribing so you can always stay up to date on our latest content. Again, the church would like to thank Frank Eppolito for joining us this week. Be sure to join us either in person or here on YouTube for our live stream service at 9.30. We hope to see you there.